Welcome to the tutorial introduction to Responsible ML. Uh, this is a tutorial prepared for USR 2021. Uh, and there are four tutors. I will introduce them briefly. We are from MI Square Data Lab at Warsaw University of Technology. And uh, MI Square is a larger group of people. Uh, we are doing, doing a lot of software, a lot of data analysis. We will learn more about our activities later as, uh, this day as well. But maybe let's start with, with the tutors. So um, oh, there are four of us. Uh, and maybe we will start this uh, tutorial with short introduction of, of all of us. So maybe it will be easier for me to start uh, with myself. I'm working as associate professor at Warsaw Institute of Technology. I'm primarily interested in responsible machine learning. Uh, also, I'm very interested in visualization, data visualization, and model visualization. Recently, uh, I'm uh, focus on uh, machine learning operations. Uh, I think that this is a very important part of responsible machine learning. Uh, also, I am a software developer. I maintain and develop a few R packages. Uh, you might know some of them. And during this workshop, I will show you one uh, called Dalek, but you will also learn about others. Feel free to contact with me. Uh, there is a link to, to my LinkedIn page. But it's quite easy to find my uh, email address. So if you have any question, please uh, contact with me, and I will be um, very happy to, to to contact with you as well. So that's about me. So maybe Hubert, maybe you will continue. Sure. So my name is Hubert Baniecki. I'm a master's student at Warsaw University of Technology. I study data science, and I'm currently interested the most in explainable machine learning. Also, some the, the, I'm also developing some tools for interactive model analysis, which I will be showing today. Also, feel free to contact me on LinkedIn or by email, and I hope that we'll have some fun today. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Anna Anna Kozak. I graduated in mathematical statistics at the Warsaw University of Technology. Uh, I am uh, interested in uh, explainable AI and uh, data visual visualization. Uh, feel uh, free uh, to contact uh, to me. Okay. okay, so hi everybody. My name is Eko Wisniewski <clears throat> and I am research software engineer at MI Square Data Lab and also a data science student at Warsaw University of Technology. I'm interested in fairness and responsible applications of deep learning. And also feel free to contact me. As you see, we are sitting in the same room, so it's easier to uh, communicate, but also if there will be any problem with internet, you will lose all of us. <laughs> Let's hope for, for the best. Okay, so uh, today we have like three hours and these three hours are divided into four parts. Before break, we are going to tackle two elements, two elements of responsible ML. Briefly, uh, we'll be talking about life cycle of predictive models. And then uh, um, I will be talking about explainability in machine learning, showing uh, side pyramid and, and some uh, deeper analysis of model, deeper exploration of models. And then after the break, we'll tackle two very new, very fresh uh, solutions. Uh, one of them is related to fairness and the do not harm principle. And second is related to automation. So we'll see how to use Model Studio and Arena to automate all things that we'll be covering during the, the first part of the, of the talk. So if you have any questions, uh, then let us know. And you can uh, let us know either um, here on chat. I see that people are uh, using this chat, so it's it's great, it's working. You can also use uh, the, the Slack channel. Of course, with Slack, it's uh, easier to maintain these materials and discussions after the workshop, but uh, during the, the, the workshop, the um, Zoom chat is also fine. All materials are on GitHub web page, and uh, I will just uh, switch my screen to this web page, and I will show you how to download these, these materials where you can find them. So let me just switch to um, this screen. Okay. Uh, so with this link, tinyurl slash rml 2021, uh, you will find a GitHub web page and uh, this uh, 
parts are linked uh, in, in the section of materials. So you'll find PDFs, you will find R code and, and sometimes compiled HTML. So you can it's, uh, you are welcome to, to execute all comments and do exercises uh, along with us. But uh, if you prefer to uh, skip some parts or read uh, in advance what will happen in a few minutes, so uh, you are of course free to do so. The data is linked here, so you can download the data, and there are also links to other other tutorials that we had uh, recently. Uh, yeah, so I hope that you can easily access this, this web page, and so uh, we'll start the introduction of the few slides that we have already covered. And now we'll, we'll move to the second part, models plus uh, site. So let me again change the screen. If you have any problem with accessing uh, materials, let me know. I hope it will be easy, but uh, yeah. any case, let us know. So the first part will be related to um, modeling and explainability. And uh, to be honest, uh, we prepared something special for, for this part unusual, so it's kind of experiment, and you are the guinea pig that we are experimenting with, uh, because uh, we move these nodes for, for this part uh, into a comic book combined with, with, um, with uh, a real book. You will find a link to the, this PDF on the GitHub webpage, so please download. It's like 30 megabytes, uh, so it might take some time, but still, uh, it will be easy to, for you to, to follow the tutorial. And the idea for using this comic book is that we'd like to present you three perspectives. And uh, it's easier to kind of distinguish these perspectives if you can use different styles to, to show all of, and, uh, them separately. Uh, so these perspectives, perspectives are, are that uh, we think that if you are going to talk about responsive machine learning, you cannot forget about math and about algorithms. So in the following pages, we'll, talk, we'll be talking also a bit about uh, math and algorithms. There need to be some formulas. But also to do responsible machine learning, you need good tools. And as, uh, as people that are using R, we have already a very good uh, platform. But again, there is a lot of packages, and we'll be doing some recommendations for you which packages to choose. And uh, sometimes you can find books or materials that are focused exclusively either on algorithms or software. So here. We'd like to share with you also the, the third part, uh, the process, because it's important. Uh, you can have good, you, have, you can have very good uh, knowledge about the behavior of different um, methods or models, but still uh, the data science uh, exploration is kind of unique, it's very iterative, so we'd like, to, we'd like to talk about this process as well. So in the following pages, you will find a, a bit of, of each of these, these, these uh, three components. They are divided uh, in a, they are different in individual style, like uh, the parts related to the process are uh, sketched as a comic book. So they um, split the, 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 the kind of mathematical part every two or three pages. The software is uh, um, linked or marked with, with the R snippet uh, section. And then the algorithms are, in most cases, just after the, the comic uh, part. So uh, in the first part of this tutorial, I will be using this um, PDF to go through all these elements. We'll be doing some hands-on exercises, but uh, all materials are here. And also, I really like the uh, visual memory, using the visual memory. So for me, instead of putting all these uh, notes, uh, comments uh, as uh, slides, I will be using this PDF to, to have this uh, memory um, guides uh, to, 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 to remember what is where and uh, why we are talking about this part right now. So these three elements will be kind of tackled during the, the workshop. Uh, the idea is to follow an uh, adventure of, of two persons, uh, Beta and Beat, and it's kind of important because they also show a very different approaches to, to modeling. And uh, beta is more mathematical, uh, maybe, maybe more, more calm, more oriented on, on, on theory, while beat is a um, hot-headed person that is preferred to code uh, instead of uh, try, instead of, of, of read. 
So uh, you can, of course, go. Uh, we will not read this aloud, but you will go for the comic and you will see how the process is, 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 um, is, um, looks like. So uh, during this workshop, we are going to uh, use a data set related to COVID pandemic. Uh, and it's uh, first because uh, it's kind of very um, current, uh, topical. Uh, we experience uh, pandemic, uh, all of us. And actually in, in our lab, we had occasion to work on our real data related to mortality. And based on this real data, we have prepared some artificial, uh, but kind of realistic uh, data sets on which we can practice both modeling and uh, the exp exploration of a model. So it's kind of very interesting, interesting use case. But please remember that the whole uh, pipeline, the whole uh, stack of tools and the whole stack of methods apply also for um, other approaches. So whatever you are doing, credit scoring or some survival analysis or other things, same tools, uh, same approaches um, work. Of course, results will be different, but, uh, but uh, the, 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 the process is similar. So the use case will be related to COVID. And uh, actually, our use case is also based on this uh, um, Whirlpool or wolf machine approach to, to machine learning that first we start with talking about conception, co conception about a model, what we are going to do, why we are going to do this. And then we repeat a few phases uh, in four iterations. So we'll be doing some exploration, then we'll do some model assembly, and then we'll be doing some model evaluation. And in different parts of this uh, tutorial, we'll be either more focused on exploration, or we'll be more focused on model assembly, or close to the end uh, of the first part, we'll be more focused on the model evaluation, or exploration, or explanation. And then uh, we also would like to tackle this, this la last mile, uh, last step, the delivery and automation. So yep, you will see a part of all of these elements. And if anything uh, will be presented too quickly, we have still like um, three hours only, then you have all materials, you can read these materials. And, and um, if anything is still unclear, let us know. So this is the, the plan. Uh, let's start. So we'll start with uh, a first model. And uh, it might be a surprise, but because usually when we are thinking about models, we think that you need to have a data. And if you think about like the competitions or um, other competitions, or if you think uh, about uh, other courses, classes related to machine learning, uh, they quite often start with a data set. They do have data set and let's, let's uh, explore and let's train a model. But in many cases, uh, in, um, even before you have any data, you can find a lot of interesting um, information on, on uh, internet. And uh, it's a case here as well. So our goal in this part of the workshop will be to prepare a machine learning model and before machine learning model for mortality prediction of COVID. Um, but before we start doing this on a real data set, uh, I would like to show you how to create a model without data. So how to do this? Quite often, you can find uh, some statistics. And in this case, uh, CDC uh, published a statistics related to COVID mortality. And uh, this is a screenshot from the website. And in this screenshot, you will see uh, how they assess the mm, relation between the mortality and age group. Uh, today, if you click on this website, you will find a slightly different numbers because they update this information every few months. But uh, yeah, the, the, the example is prepared for, for, for mm, this data. So let's create a model in R and let's validate a model based on this information. So without data, let's start with something based only on the main knowledge. How to do this? So first, uh, in this tutorial, we treat model as a function, just a standard mathematical function that we take observation from like p-dimensional vector, and then we turn this observation into some prediction, some score. So if we are going to create a model, we need to prepare a function. And this is the R function. It's kind of uh, easy. It just takes a vector, which um, a data frame, which is supposed to have a column H, 
And uh, in these lines, what is happening is that uh, the age is being checked, whatever it's in uh, given interval. And then according to our age, uh, we assign a particular um, relative risk to our selected patients. So if someone is um, uh, below 4.5, uh, then we assign relative risk equal to two to, to such persons. So this is a standard R function. And uh, in fact, models that we'll be working on are just R functions. Some of these parameters will be trained on data, but here we have the luxury that actually all these parameters were kind of known on, on, or presented on our website. But it's still a machine learning model. In uh, this tutorial, uh, to work with such models, we need to create some wrapper around them because models will have different structures. This is a, just a function, R function. But some models we have uh, kind of complex uh, structures, sometimes in S3 R classes or S4 classes or R6 classes, depending on the library that we can use to train a model. So to, to have some uniform interface around this, 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 uh, this model, uh, we'll be using a Dalek package. And in the Dalek package, you can provide a model and uh, explain or specify how model predictions should be extracted from the model. Now it's easy because the model is just a function, so it's enough to call the function, but you will see later that it might be more complicated. For some models, you need to have some speci specific arguments, specific parameters to extract, um, to extract information from the model. So what is important here? This is our first iteration. Uh, important part are that you don't really sometimes need a data to create a model. Uh, some models can be learned from literature. Then uh, we will treat models as R functions. But what is also important for this tutorial, we need this additional extra um, overlap or uh, uh, abstraction uh, over models. This abstraction will uniform, unify different models. And then using this um, Dalek wrappers, um, despite the internal structure of the model, you can always use a predict function to calculate predictions out of the model. And uh, I guess that uh, those of you who have experience with R, they know that some models by default return uh, vectors with numbers, some return data frames, some of them return uh, categorical variables. So here, this explainer is needed to have this uniform interface. Okay, um, so this is the first model. And then uh, what we should do with the model, of course, we should check how good is the model. So in the next part of the story, let I and we try to find a suitable data, a right data to validation. And here we have the luxury that in fact we will have two data sets. One of them will be used for training and second will be used for validation. Of course, uh, sometimes we have just one data set that we can work on and we need to use some specific techniques to split the data set into training and uh, validation part. But here in this use case, we have this luxury that uh, actually we have two independent data sets. And this, uh, in, this, in this story, it's even nicer because these data sets are so-called out of time data sets. So if you are just uh, sampling from same data set to subsets, which is kind of quite often, then these two subsets are very similar to each other. But uh, in, in real world, it's kind of frequent that uh, with time, some relations are changing or, or some distributions are, are being changed. This is called data drift or model drift. So here we have uh, some sam uh, samples of data from two different uh, time intervals, one from summer, second from um, uh, spring, to validate the model on so-called out-of-time uh, data. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's validate. Let's validate. Um, First, we need to read the data. And the data, you can download the data from a GitHub web page. Uh, it's in, there are two uh, CSV files. One is called COVID Spring, and second is called COVID Summer. We'll be using COVID Spring for training and COVID Summer for, uh, for validation. There are the standard uh, CSV files. And in the remaining part of materials, you 
um, you will uh, you can you can use uh, these two objects. Uh, small comment here. Uh, I will have some uh, time for hands-on exercises, but if you like to follow these presentation these, these these examples. Uh, along with uh, your R console, type, typing all these comments into R console, then you can either copy them from the PDF, which maybe is not the best idea because this arrow uh, is not copied in a uh, right way. The better approach is to open this RMD file, and all these comments, all these descriptions are in the RMD file. You will not find a comic book there, so yeah, it's still better to use the PDF. But it's much easier to just open the RMD and line by line execute these, these comments. So if then you can just follow uh, these, these um, examples uh, line by line. And again, if you have any problem with accessing materials, let us know. Uh, we have a few people uh, on chat so they, they can assist you. So where we are, we are uh, with, uh, with two data sets. So then, of course, as a, a good statistician, we should uh, explore the data. Here, the exploration is relatively simple. We just draw a few basic uh, summaries because um, I guess that the classical approach would be to do a lot of exploration, data exploration, and then uh, head ahead uh, for, for modeling. But in our process, the iterations are very quick, very, very, um, uh, and, and the exploration might be on the beginning just a simple exploration for data, but then we'll show you how to use model exploration to even quicker learn relations um, related to the model. So here we have to start, uh, we just start with, with a histogram for uh, these two groups, and we see this is kind of expected. We know from media and from other places that. Uh, all the people um, are more exposed uh, uh, to, to the COVID, and the, the red um, color here stands for people who died. Uh, so, so we see that this uh, older age group is it's in fact uh, more exposed to the risk. But also in the data, we have kind of interesting uh, features like comorbidities, uh, like diabetes or other diseases. So you can also use a mosaic plot or other techniques to, to see um, uh, what is the link between different feature and, and the target uh, variable, the binary variable. Okay, so I found that uh, in, in medicine, uh, it's very frequent that in medical papers, you have so-called table one. And table one is a table that just summarizes uh, your features uh, for uh, selected uh, subgroups. And uh, it's uh, because it's requested by medical journals, uh, you will also find a few very good R packages that uh, prepare such summaries. And here uh, you can use a table one package. It has a very interesting, very simple to use function create table one. You can just specify variables, data, and the uh, um, target uh, column. And then out of this, you will get a nice HTML table or latex table, or just markup, mark, uh, markup table with, with summaries. So here you have all features, variables that are present in the data. And uh, then you have information about the, the number of cases uh, in both groups, survived and ended. And what is important here, and also it's very common, you should not model without uh, checking what is in the data because sometimes you have some information leakage. And here, the story, the backstory is that we'd like to prepare a model that will suggest uh, who should be vaccinated. So who is more exposed to the risk, assuming that if someone is exposed, it should be vaccinated first. So uh, some of these features, as you see, they are collected during the interviews uh, with um, uh, Polish, um, counterpart of NIH, but uh, we should not use these variables. And uh, for example, the last four, like hospitalization, fever, cough, these are very important uh, variables. If you calculate the p-values or summary statistics, you will see that these three are probably the uh, most important variables, but uh, we should not use them because we don't have access to these features in advance. So you can have a very good uh, model uh, with very high performance, uh, but using these uh, forbidden features. So during training, maybe these features are in the data, 
during validation, maybe because of some uh, problem with the process, maybe they're also in the in the data, but in our real applications, they won't be um, present uh, during the prediction. So in this exercise, we are just using this exploration to recognize that there is some relation between the target variable and uh, particular, particular variables, and also we should remove some features. And this is kind of important step there is a lot of examples in which one can get a very high model with very high performance, but uh, because of some data leakage, uh, the, the performance is too optimistic. So yeah, this, uh, this, this, the, the first iteration start, uh, ends with a, a subsection of uh, features that can be used for modeling. Okay, so we have a CDC model. Those are basic models. We have data that can be used for validation. Let's validate this um, the model. Validation is very important, and uh, in a second you will see, and probably you already know that there is, there is a lot of different uh, measures that can be used for validation. What I'd like to uh, highlight here is that the selection of uh, the measure is very important, and it should be, of course, related to the research questions that we have in mind, because using uh, the wrong um, measure my uh, lead to a right, wrong model. So um, let's uh, maybe for a second uh, focus on different uh, choices that we have, and then I'll, I will convince you why I will see the best uh, choice in our case. So for regression, probably you know that there are such summaries like mean square error or root mean uh, uh, square, error, square, square error, but uh, we are working on classification case and um, I find kind of uh, amusing to use a, uh, a pregnancy test as an example of the confusion matrix for, for binary classification. So talking about different uh, measures of assessing model performance, uh, you will find um, uh, very different measures like sensitivity, specificity, precision recall, accuracy of one, and so on. All these measures actually base, are based on, on four values, and these values are true positive cases, false, false positive cases, uh, false negative cases, and true negative cases. So just to maybe quickly define what are these cases, you can imagine a very simple test for pregnancy, and uh, you can imagine a binary situation like someone is pregnant or not, and a binary situation that uh, someone has a morning sickness or not, and still, using our data, these are really data. You can just get this, this statistics from uh, this uh, web page. Um, you can see that this simple test, morning sickness, has given sensitivity and uh, given specificity. So it's not that sensitive, but it's, uh, it has kind of high specificity. And these numbers, sensitivity, is calculated as a fraction of true positives among all uh, true positives and false negatives, while specificity is a fraction of true negatives among all true negatives and fal false positives. But of course, you can uh, define different uh, other different measures, and here you have a short table for these measures. Um, they work pretty well if you have like these two options, like the test has two options, like has sickness or has not sickness. In our case, you remember that what we can learn from the CDC webpage, there were actually some risk um, scores, some uh, continue, some continuous um, risk risk scores. So in such case, uh, you need to, in in order to use these um, these statistics, you need to binarize uh, the continuous score into two subgroups, lower or higher, to some uh, cutoff. So this is how the area under the curve uh, is being defined. The ROC curve, this curve, is being calculated as a set of points for different cutoffs, and these different points differ in the selection of cutoff. So if you choose a different cutoffs, like uh, in the previous pages, you have this uh, risk that's like uh, 10 times larger, uh, 45 times larger, and so on. Uh, if you uh, put a cutoff like uh, 50 and say that uh, these groups have larger risk than 50 times um, higher than reference group, and these people have a lower risk than 50 times larger than reference group, then you can divide all these um, patients into two subgroups, like higher and lower than some cutoff. 
So for different cutoffs, you can get uh, different tables like this one. For different tables, you can get a different coefficients like specificity and specificity. And with the different coefficients, you can have uh, the whole curve called ROC curve. And the curve summarizes how good is the um, actual uh, test, because if it's random, uh, this curve will be very close to the diagonal. If the test has a very high specificity and very high sensitivity, despite the, the cutoff, then uh, this curve will be very close to the kind of rectangular. So just by measuring, calculating the area under this curve, we can have a very nice um, description how good is the ranking, how good are these scores, if the scores are sorted according to the, 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 the risk. So this is why in these examples we'll be using AOC as a measure for, for, for performance. Uh, it's just one of possible values. You can find lots of different statistics, but for this use case, it looks like a, it's a very good uh, choice. So we have uh, data, we have data set, we have a model, we have a measure to assess the model performance. Now, let me show how to uh, use this uh, model and data to actually calculate performance. Um, I hope that uh, you uh, remember or even executed this example for CDC um, model uh, created as R function. Here I have same lines with two additional components, two additional arguments. To calculate, to estimate the performance of a model, I need the validation data because the performance will be evaluated on something here on evaluation, on validation data. So here to this explainer, I've added uh, two lines that specifies the data and the target variable on the validation data COVID summary. So once this object is prepared, and again, this is kind of additional fast because you need to specify uh, some additional abstraction. In addition to your R function, you need to create this additional DAL explainer. But once you create this explainer, you can easily use a large collection of functions that are um, prepared for, for model exploration. So for example, the first function that we are going to use is model performance. It's just enough to use model performance function with the uh, selector explainer to calculate uh, various statistics. Here, the, the function knows that it's classification because it, um, it was specified with the type argument. So now in that classification, these various uh, statistics were calculated and we can see some simple summary for, for this model, how good it is on the validation data set. And again, uh, all um, examples that I'm going to show you um, are working in a way that you first need to create explainer with a model, then you can calculate some um, model explanation, and then all these model explanations can be visualized with the plot function. And this is what is happening here. You can use the generic plot function with uh, the calculated explanation, and then you can just create a visual summary for this explanation. So there are a few summaries implemented, uh, like ROC, box plot, or lift. In different domains, uh, different summaries are more prevalent. So for example, for credit scoring, it's kind of uh, very common to use uh, lift curves that summarize um, the Mm, kind of uh, uh, lift uh, in the subgroup of, of, of customers uh, in terms of risk of, of uh, credit default, uh, but uh, we will be using ROC caps. But again, there are different uh, statistics that can be easily selected with the geom uh, argument. Okay, so what we have is the assessment, how good is the model? It's like the AOC, it's 0.9. It's pretty high accuracy. I told you that uh, the random model will have AOC equal to 0 0.5 or close to 0 0.5. So this is kind of close to, to one. And uh, on uh, one hand, you may say that's enough. We have a good model. It's kind of confirmed by uh, CDC. So it's kind of official with official statistics. Why not to uh, use the model and, and uh, yeah, and that's, that's all. But uh, in the data scientist spirit, uh, there should be this force that forces you to try other approach. 
maybe you will find a better model. Maybe by checking, changing something, changing hyperparameters or changing uh, structure or class of models that can be used, maybe you can get a higher, better results. So let's let's see whatever for this data, whatever can build a better model with some known um, machine learning uh, approaches. So uh, probably the first choice uh, will be linked with um, logistic regression. But here, uh, for, for some reason, and I will tell you later why, uh, I choose three base models. So let's see whatever we can get a better model with, with classification trees. Um, on the beginning of this uh, book, you will find uh, links to uh, very good source materials. And of course, these three hours are not enough to cover details in, in uh, every or even a few machine learning approaches. So I'm not going to tell you in detail how the certain trees are working. I guess that for some of, some of you know this already, uh, some of you might read it because it's, it's just summarized here. I will just present some very short intuition uh, because it will be important later. We'll be creating more and more complex models. Currently, we are using very, very simple models that were proposed like um, 45 years ago. So they are pretty, pretty old. Uh, again, uh, you will find a lot of different R packages that can be used for training. Here, for the decision tree model, I prefer to use party kit package, which is really good because first you have a very fine control on different arguments, but also you can get a pretty good visualization of a model, which is also important. So actually to train a model, this is super simple in, with a party, party kit. You can just specify the formula, the data set, some additional hyperparameters, and with just one line you can train a model and then with one line you can visualize the model. The model is here. We have few uh, variables, and uh, the way how decision trees are being uh, grown is that first uh, every variable is being checked, whatever they can be splitted, and which variable gives the best split. Uh, you can choose a different measures for the perform the, the quality of split, like Gini or, or um, entropy. So there is some short discussion on the left page. Uh, but uh, here uh, we are just using defaults to, to see what is happening with the model. So it turns out that uh, uh, the best candidate for split was the age variable and the best uh, cutoff was uh, 67. Then this procedure is being repeated. So in the subgroup of patients that are older than 67, uh, it turns out that the second best candidate for split are cardiovascular diseases. And this procedure, procedure is being repeated. So finally, with uh, given hyperparameters, you end up with a uh, given decision tree with seven nodes. And uh, what is very nice uh, about decision trees is that they are very transparent, especially small trees. Uh, and this is relatively small. You can easily see uh, which features are being used uh, for um, specific decisions. Yeah, so you can see that uh, in the CDC model, we are using only age, but it turns out that for, for people that are old, uh, younger than 67, also the uh, other diseases are important, like cancer status, while for people that are older, other diseases are important, here cardiovascular diseases. So we see that, uh, of course, both things contribute to higher risk, but for different age groups, either cancer or cardiovascular diseases are the second most important feature. So, okay, we have a model. This model was trained on the COVID spring data. So now we can validate the model. And this is uh, where the direct explainer will pay off because again, we'll comp create some additional uh, wrapper around the model. But with this wrapper, it will be very easy for us to compare different models. This is where we are creating the wrapper. Uh, we are using explain function. First argument is this uh, decision tree. Then we need to specify how probabilities would be extracted from the tree. And uh, for different models, uh, the way how these scores are, needs to be extracted, uh, there are kind of uh, different interfaces. Dalek uh, will um, figure out uh, these, uh, these functions, um, um, some, some uh, predefined uh, functions. But here I've specified this function just to show you how this is uh, 
how this works. So you can forget about this line, and this will also work. But just to know what is happening underneath, it's good to 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 have this as well. Uh, once you create this uh, predict function, then in all following um, steps, you can just use this explainer, and it will always return scores. So you don't need to worry that some models have different structures. Okay, so we are using same data for validation, COVID summer. Uh, it is a classification model, and uh, in plots, we'd like to use a label tree uh, to, to make it easier to recognize um, uh, different models. From here, the model is totally different. The first CDC model was based purely on uh, domain knowledge. This model is based uh, on, on data. But the way how we can explore the model is totally uh, uniform. So you can use model performance function, you, calculate, you can calculate all these statistics, you can plot them with the plot function. So just to highlight what is important here, oh, more complex model and higher IUC. Oh, that's good. And when you use the plot function, you can specify as many explainers, explanations as you wish, and they will be all plotted in the same, plot, same, same chart. So it's kind of very frequent situation that uh, you are developing different models with totally different structures, and then you need to select one of them. So it's pretty convenient uh, to, to put them in the same chart to compare them against each other. Okay, but uh, decision trees are pretty old. Let's try something more sophisticated. And probably the next step should be a uh, assemble of decision trees, so random forest. And uh, yep, uh, Bayman, um, 20 years ago, uh, wrote a beautiful paper how you can reduce variance in uh, decision, decision trees by using uh, bootstrap aggregating with some additional very nice features. So again, this is not a good time to go into details of how random forests are working, but just to give you some idea, we are just combining uh, trees trained on different bootstrap samples. These trees are different because they have slightly different data sets used for training, and then they are being aggregated uh, together. Uh, they are being aggregated together with average or some voting or something like that. So let me, let me uh, now train such random forest model in R. It sounds like something very complex because you need to uh, sample like uh, 100 or 500 um, bootstrap samples. But again, in R, you can do this easily with existing packages like uh, Ranter or with, with uh, random forest. Uh, but here I am using MLR3 because MLR3 will give you some additional benefit that will pay off in, in a few slides. So this uh, line uh, defines a task. So this is how MLR3 approach uh, um, predictive modeling, you need to specify the ID of the task, data set, it's called backend because it might be larger and it might be stored in some database, and then the target variable, and you need to specify because it's by the classification, you need to specify the positive classes. It can be either yes or no. And so having the task defined, in the second step, you need to create a learner. Learner is uh, a definition of algorithm that will be used for training all required parameters. So here, for learner, we are using render, and we are using uh, render with 25 trees. So the third step uh, in training with MR3 is uh, training. You can just use the train function out of this um, model, uh, out of this learner, and the train function in place will um, tune, will, will find the uh, coefficients for all these uh, decision trees. So it will sample bootstrap data sets, it will train trees, and it will create the whole um, ensemble. Uh, it's a kind of a sophisticated procedure, but as you saw, we can do this in like three steps, and then you can wrap this MR model in, uh, with the leg explainer. Again, you, in the explain function, you can just specify the model, and then you can um, select the right predict function to extract scores from the MLR3 model. You see that this function is different than these two other examples. For CDC model, we have different predict function. For decision tree, we have different predict function. 
Here we have also a different predict function, and Dalek will guess the right predict function, but just to show you how, it's, uh, how it works, uh, here is an example. So, okay, we have three models. Again, with the same function model performance, you can calculate performance of this uh, model, and you can plot all these three models in a single chart. Hopefully, uh, fortunately, fortunately, the AOC is higher and higher. You know, we started with 0 0.9 for CDC model, then we have 0 0.91 for uh, tree based model, and here you have 0 for, uh, 94. So it's pretty, pretty uh, good improvement. Can you do better? Uh, Rano Forest is a very good model. It's very frequently used as a default um, benchmark for tabular data. It's pretty robust. Uh, it has a lot of good uh, statistical properties. But uh, you, can you need to specify some hyperparameters, like number of trees, uh, the procedure for sampling uh, particular rows, the minimum node size, and so on. And uh, this manual tuning can be replaced by some AutoML tool. So in the fourth model, I would like to show you how to use um, MR3 tuning package to find the optimal subset of hyperparameters. So this is uh, probably the most advanced model that will be covered today. And again, the whole procedure is described in this, um, in this sketch. So the idea for hyperparameter tuning is to have some methods that will suggest you hyperparameters, will sample you hyperparameters, and then you need a good measure to evaluate how good are these suggestions, and you iterate this, uh, pro uh, this process until some uh, stop criteria. So you need to specify these three things, the space for hyperparameters and the um, way how they will be sampled, the evaluation uh, criteria, and then the terminator, when it should be stopped. So how to do this with MR3 tuning library and paradox library? First, you need to specify the search space. And here the search space says that you have the um, hyperparameter number of trees. Let's try different values from 50 to 500. Then you have a hyperparameter maximum depth. Let's try different uh, hyperparameters from value one to 10 and so on. You have different uh, hyperparameters like speed rule. Let's see. Is it better to use the Gini split rule or extra trees? Having defined the uh, hyperparameter space, now you can uh, define the whole uh, setting for, for, for AutoML uh, model. Here you have the learner. It describes what family of algorithms we are going to, to use. Resampling is the way how a model will be evaluated. We cannot use validation data for these internal evaluations. So here, these two lines says that we'll be using AUC, but calculate that on, on five-fold cross-validation. So internally, data will be five-fold cross-validated, and uh, the performance of the model will be uh, measured. So just a small comment. Uh, I am kind of, uh, the, the learning curve might be pretty steep. We started with a very simple model. Now, now we are talking about very sophisticated machine for AutoML. Just wait a few minutes. I will uh, return to my more basic applications in a few minutes. I, I will just cover the whole spectrum of, of possible solutions. So we have search space, we have the evaluation metric, and we have the terminator. You can specify different stopping criteria. Here we use a very simple one, number of evaluations. So just try 10 random hyperparameters uh, sets and uh, choose the best out of these uh, 10 uh, hyperparameters, uh, hyperparameter sets. And here we are using random search for selecting uh, these candidates for hyperparameters. Uh, in MR3, again, you can just use the train function in place. This will estimate, uh, select the best hyperparameters and the uh, coefficients for, for, for trees uh, in, in random forest model. So with this, you have a model, and now we can check how good is the model. To do this, again, we need to create a dialog explainer. The predict function is again slightly different for some reason, but uh, once we wrap the um, AutoML model with Dalek explainer, we can forget about these internal differences because we have this uniform interface. So having this Dalek explainer, we can now easily calculate model performance and plot the ROC curves. And what we can see here, it's not, um, it's not like it's always the case, but in this example, 
uh, with the AutoML model, you have a better results than for default parameters. So this random render uh, model, random forest model with default parameters um, was slightly worse. It is not a big difference because we are very close to one, but still with AutoML, you can get a higher performance. So we have four models. And uh, should we stop here? You can ask the question, uh, now we train for models and uh, is it enough? Like, uh, should we say that uh, because IAUC is the highest, uh, there is nothing else that we can do? So uh, I think not. I think that uh, here actually the real fun begins. And uh, what you can do more is to do more sophisticated analysis of these models. They are complex. They are very different. Like with tree, you can just pl plot the tree, but with uh, uh, 100 um, decision trees in a forest, it's much harder to plot them. Of course, you can do this, but uh, it will be hard to figure out what is happening in the model. And if you have additionally these uh, hyperparameters um, or other sophisticated models, it will be very complex to understand what is happening. So to really understand what, what is happening, um, I would like to present you a few uh, procedures linked with model explainability. This is an important part of, of responsible machine learning. This is this pyramid that uh, let's, let's see what is there. We already covered a part of it, uh, was related with model performance. So uh, like the, 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 the top of the pyramid, uh, here you can kind of uh, measure whatever the performance of model is, is high or not, but there is much more to discover. So in the remaining examples, we will be just going for this pyramid to dig deeper and deeper in the model and to learn more and more about the relations that are in the model. Okay, so first stop will be related with feature importance. Uh, for some models, we have uh, some existing uh, methods for, for assessment of uh, feature importance, and, uh, but they are kind of model specific. So you will have a different values for linear models, you will have different values for decision trees, you will have different values for random forest. If, if you would like to compare different models in terms of importance of features in these models, you need um, something that is model agnostic. So hopefully, fortunately, uh, we have a measure like that. Uh, one of them is called permutational variable importance. It's working in a way that um, you can just check how much the model performance degradates if a selected column is permutated. So you can imagine your COVID data, and then uh, you can see that the initial performance was 0 0.95, but then if a column X is permutated, the, there's some drop in performance. And by checking how large is the drop, you can assess how significant was this variable. So this is a very simple technique, but very, very useful. So. I, I think there are really some sleeping beauty that is just waiting for us to, to discover this and use, it, use this. With Dalek, once you have explainer, you can simply use the model parts function, model because this is a model level analysis, global analysis, and parts because it's related to, to importance of parts of the model. And with this model parts function, you can calculate uh, how important are uh, particular features. So here, Difference mean that uh, you calculate the model performance uh, with all features without any change. Then you permute this column and you see that the performance dropped, but just uh, it's almost a zero. It's not the case for H. You see that H is very important variable. And if you sample, if you uh, perturb, permute uh, values in the H column, then the performance of model drops a lot. So it's an important value because if you blind the model for this value, then the performance will be much lower. And you can do this for all models. We have four candidate models. Let's compare them. And just you, you can, now we can forget about all these internal differences. These models, again, they have very different structures. But once they are wrapped in this explainer, you can just calculate uh, important characteristics with the model parts function, and you can visualize this importance with the plot function, generic plot function, just by specifying these four um, explanations. So here is the summary. In these plots, 
the beginning of each bar is the initial one minus AOC. So it's the initial model performance. And then the longer is the bar, the more uh, you will lose if this particular column is blinded. So for CDC model, the only important variable is age, because we remember that it was just a table with few columns and they were all age groups. So in this uh, R function that we have created, there is nothing except age. So of course, all other variables have, have zero importance. For the tree-based model, it's slightly different because we have like three um, variables there. When you plot the tree, you see that there is age, cardiovascular diseases, and cancer, and they have some importance. The initial performance is slightly better than for CDC model. Age is the most important feature, but there are others, others as well. And for the random forest model and for the automatically tuned random forest model, you also see that the initial performance is better, higher, uh, so one minus AUC is lower, but also the length of the bar is uh, for age is, is much longer. So for both, both these models, they see that the most important variable is age. There is some effect of other features, and uh, it's not uh, zero, it's, it's, there, it's a positive effect, but the most important effect is age. Okay, so this technique, uh, this technique uh, was here in the pyramid for model exploration. Like we started with the global assessment of the model performance, it was AUC, and now we dig to decompose this global performance into parts that can be attributed to some variables. So we learned that for uh, we learned that for uh, age. This is the most important variable for each model. Some of these models do not use anything else, like CDC. Some of this, these models are using something else, but H is most important. So let's go deeper. Let's see what we can find uh, more in, in this model. OK. Uh, so uh, in the next uh, stage, you can not only see which variable is important, but uh, you can learn how how uh, it's related with the target. What is learned by the model? What kind of relation is learned by the model? And these models do not assume any specific family of relations, like in linear models, you need to specify either uh, splines or, or some uh, polynomials or something like that. In, in uh, tree-based models, there are just splits, but there is a lot of them. So these are pretty, fl pretty flexible models. So let's see what has been learned by these models. To do this, you can use the PD partial dependence profiles. There are other techniques as well, but here I will focus on partial dependence because of their simplicity and how they work. You can just imagine that you would like to see what is the expected model response if the particular variable is replaced by some value. So here we replace the variable xi by value t, and you will see how the model expected um, expected uh, or average, because we use estimator, model response, how it will change uh, after this replacement. So uh, this is an example how the model looks like. For uh, variable age, we are uh, replacing all um, values of the age variable by value 10, 15, 20, 25, and so on. And then we check what is the average model, model prediction? And it looks like uh, this is the average model prediction. So this is this partial dependence profile. It behaves kind of along our expectations because for young people, the average prediction is low, for older people is high. What we can learn as well is where is the steepest increase in the risk. You know, this is kind of, kind of interesting. Uh, the curve is not monotonic, so you saw that uh, here, we have this non-monotonic uh, behavior. Uh, in some models, you can enforce a monotonicity constraint, but in random forest, you cannot do this by default. So it's, uh, there is some variance for, for, for these age groups, but there is just a few patients there. So this is where the variance comes from. Okay, how to do this in Dalek? Again, it's very, very simple. The only thing that you need to do is to use the model profile function. Model, because you are doing the global analysis, in this pyramid, you are on the left side. And once you are on the left side, it's model. So you are doing this model, 
and profile because you are interested in the profile. And then you need to specify the explainer and uh, you can, by default, all variables are being calculated, but if you like to make it quicker, uh, so you can specify variables that are for, of interest for you. And here we're gonna focus on, on age variable. Having this explanation, you can use plot function. This is nice, but the, 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 the largest fun, the, the largest gain is from the comparison of different models. So you can do the same for all four models that we have trained, and uh, you can combine them in a single chart, and you can see what has been learned by these models. So let's, let's maybe focus on these results. The CDC model, uh, it was this table from uh, CDC webpage. So it behaves as we expected. There are these cutoffs defined in this table, and you see some jumps in, in these cutoffs. Mm, other variables are not important, so here the expected value is pretty easy to calculate. Then we have the tree model, and the tree model actually have only a few splits related to age. And you can see these splits, one is here, and the second is here, and there should be a third one somewhere that is barely vis visible. For uh, more sophisticated models like Ranger or uh, Ranger with automatically tuned hyperparameters, these curves are smoother. Uh, there are always trees underneath, but they are aggregated based on the large number of trees, so these profiles are smoother. And you see that kind of these three models, render three, so the models that we, let me use a different color. The models that we train on the data, they have this high increase in mortality around age, it's like uh, 60. While for CTC model, the highest increase in mortality was after age uh, 75. It was like 78 or something. So you see that uh, different models learned different relations. And of course, uh, if you are working uh, for predictive modeling, and if uh, uh, you know more about the domain, it's easier to say why this is, uh, they are different. What might be the source of differences? We should remember that the training data for these uh, three models are actually from Polish population. Why the CDC model was built on uh, CDC data, so it was for United States population. So it's a very different um, age structure, um, race structure, and um, gender is more or less 50-50, but other features are different. So, so we can compare these models, what has been learned by these models. And it's pretty useful. Uh, you can do this and you can do even more sophisticated analysis. You can plot these partial dependence profiles splitted in subgroups. So in addition to showing the average or expected value, you can calculate expected value independently for people with diabetes and without diabetes. We expect that there is some uh, interaction because with age, some of these uh, diseases are more frequent like with cardiovascular diseases, uh, after 50, it's, um, the, the, the chances that you have this disease are much higher than for young people. So these features are correlated. And of course, there are people that have many diseases and people that have none of them. So all these features are, are correlated. So it's very useful to, to explore, to visualize model behavior for subgroups. Here, you can easily present um, age with diabetes, to see what is the model response for these two groups. Here, these two curves are pretty mm. parallel. So it looks like uh, the effects of these features are more or less learned in additive fashion, but for different features, it might be a different. So it's always what was to, to, do, to, to, do, to do this. And there is much more. Uh, I'm not going to present you details uh, because uh, we have like just 20 minutes for uh, this part. But there's, there's, there's much more that you can do with these profiles, and you can read about all other approaches uh, or possibilities um, in this uh, part. But uh, like in statistics, uh, I would like I would to say we, but uh, I maybe should say uh, I. Uh, I. I was kind of restricted to think about models in a global perspective. Like we are interested sometimes in mathematical behaviors, so we are interested in global behaviors. On average, how model behave? On average, is it good or bad? On average, is it increasing or decreasing? While 
quite often in high state decisions, what is really important is the particular prediction. So you have a particular patient, customer, I know, individual, and you are doing a single prediction and you would like to understand better what is happening with this prediction. So uh, what is more and more um, interesting and uh, new methods are being developed for local analysis of model. And in the machine learning world, actually this perspective is even more prevalent. The global model behavior is sometimes not that interesting because um, uh, instances are very, very different from each other. What is of interest is the detailed analysis of a single instance. So let me show what does it mean and how to do this. Here we'll be using an example of Steve. Uh, Steve, oh, it's in Polish. Uh, Steve is a person. Um, here you have some characteristics of Steve. And we'll see what we can learn about model behavior for Steve. So now we'll be talking about, oh, it's so large. Now we'll be talking about this uh, left part, um, predict, related to a single prediction. We can use predict function to calculate, calculate this prediction, but now let's see what exactly, um, how it's being calculated, which variables contribute to this prediction. So there are a few uh, procedures that uh, can be used to understand factors that contribute to model prediction. Um, in this uh, short workshop, I would like to show you just uh, two approaches, which are closely interconnected. So we like to uh, calculate effects of particular instances of a, uh, of a uh, model response, and we'll be, do we'll be doing this in a sequen sequence of conditionings. So let's imagine a situation like that, that you start with kind of average model response, like uh, you have 10,000 patients, and on average, the average risk score is like 0 0.01. And now we can uh, say, okay, but my case is different. I'm not average person. My age is like 75. Let's condition all of these uh, variables on age equal to 70, 71. So you can do this uh, sequence of conditioning, cond conditionings, and with every new conditioning, you will get a slightly different average. Uh, you can repeat this conditioning uh, for every variable, and at the end, uh, you will condition on all variables, so you will end up in the prediction for the single observation. So this is a single observation, and this is the average from population. So by these conditionings, you see how this average became this prediction. We can learn from uh, these uh, from these conditions, conditionings, we can learn uh, which variables change the average most significantly. Maybe I will show you an example for our uh, Steve. Uh, here we have all data. This is the distribution of scores for every patient in our 10,000 um, 10, uh, patients data set. And then we can condition on age, age and cardiovascular diseases, age, cardiovascular disease and gender and so on. And by conditioning, you see that the distribution of predictions also are changing. And the red dot shows you where is the average, expected value of these conditionings. And it's, um, uh, it's, uh, the change is large at the beginning for the most important variable age. It's much smaller on the end. Unfortunately, for uh, non-additive models, uh, depending on the order, these changes will be different. So it's not obvious what you can do, how you can deal with different uh, changes, attributions for different orderings. But you can imagine two very simple strategies. One, let's use some heuristic that will try to guess variables with the highest impact, and uh, you will condition on the beginning on the variables with the highest impact. So then the first coefficient should be large and uh, remaining will be smaller. So this approach, in the that package is called breakdown. And there is a heuristic that is doing this conditioning by, by looking for some efficient or optimal um, ordering. The second approach is that let's try all of these orderings. Yep, average across all possible orderings. There is a lot of them. So maybe large number. We are statisticians, so we can average and we can control the, the variance. So let's average across large, variance, large number of orderings. And this approach is called Shapley values. 
So both are based on these conditional orderings, but in one case, you are using some heuristic to find the kind of uh, uh, strongest, most important variables at the beginning, while in Shapley values, you just average across many different possible orderings. Uh, both things can be easily implemented, uh, executed around in, in, in Dalek. You need to, of course, create uh, the instance of interest. Here, we can define our stiff, uh, male, 76 years, with cardiovascular diseases, without diabetes, and so on. And then having this observation, we can calculate the, uh, the score for Ranger model, for example. And now we can use predict part function to calculate these contributions. Predict because we are on the right side of the pyramid, and parts because we are interested in the parts, which variables influence the, the prediction. So these are these individual contributions. You can see that some of these uh, features increase significantly the um, risk of death. Like, of course, cardiovascular diseases, they shoot, age, they shoot. Uh, some of them decrease or do not change the, the risk. So with the um, plot function, you can simply plot these uh, values, and you will get either the Shapley values, depending on the type argument. So you can get the Shapley values with box plots. So you can see how accurate is this estimation of, of, uh, of uh, attribution of given variable. Or you can have this breakdown plot, which uh, uh, has slightly different values because we are using just single ordering. And here we are using the waterfall plot to see how particular effects contribute to the final model prediction. For Steve, it's 0 0.32, so it's it's pretty high, and it's high because uh, he's uh, older older guy, not that old, but uh, from the COVID perspective, uh, old. Okay, uh, can we do more? Of course we can, and we have still like 15 minutes to say what we can do. So let's let's use this 15 minutes. We have this py our pyramid, and our pyramid we have the next. Uh, level in which we can do the profile, the profile analysis of the prediction. From this level, from this level, we learned which variables are important, but we still don't know how these features are linked with uh, model prediction. So with the profile analysis, we can do this. Uh, to execute profile analysis, again, uh, we will have a single function, predict because it's on for the single prediction and profile because you are interested in profile. Uh, you can calculate these profiles and then you can use a plot function to visualize these profiles. So I will do this uh, for continuous variable eight and for critical variable cardiovascular diseases. And here are these profiles. So these are conditional profiles for Steve. They are calculated in a way that uh, this is a Steve. He is 60, 76 years old male. And his model here predicted uh, uh, risk was like uh, 32, if I remember correctly. So we can check how the prediction would change if the um, age variable will be lower or, or higher. So this plot shows you this individual response. It's not average, but it's individual response. And you see that, uh, in fact, the render model learned that being below 60 makes a big difference. And being above uh, 65, uh, it's also a big difference, but in a worse uh, direction. So this is individual profile. It was for age, and this is for cardiovascular diseases. There are just two possible values there. So there are just two averages. And the dot shows you where is Steve, still, have, um, still has uh, this cardiovascular diseases, so the dot is, is here. So again, you can dig deeper, you can explore your models in detail, and you are not limited to a single model analysis, because we have trained four models, you can nicely, easily combine, compare perspectives um, given by all these four models. And again, here you have four colors, we strip the legend uh, because it used too much space, but there are four colors, like CDC model, three model render automatically tuned render. And you see from these different perspectives, what is the possible uh, risk for, for Steve and uh, how it's linked with the most important variable age. 
and you see that uh, these models learn uh, pretty different uh, perspectives. <laughs> okay, uh, there are more parameters that you can use. Uh, in these materials, you will find these parameters explained with maybe um, deeper details. However, it's still like just 42 pages in which we'd like to show you both the mathematical part, the software part, and the, um, and the process part. So, of course, uh, it's kind of um, uh, just, uh, you know, a small portion of, of things that you can uh, get out of the software and, and methodology. So I strongly recommend you to go deeper, and there are links. You saw that on margin, you found some links. And many of them refer to these uh, three books. Elements of Statistical Learning is an excellent book related to the methodology. You will find lots of discussion about this balance between the variance and, and uh, bias trade-off. Uh, lots of examples and discussion why uh, the evaluation on the different data set uh, what are benefits and, and um, uh, problems with such evaluation. So very good reading. Uh, MLR3 book, it's a very nice book that shows you how to use sometimes complex uh, features of MLR3 package. And uh, there is a lot of different packages in R and uh, probably some of you are using Carrot or Tidy Models or some other solution. But uh, at least here, you find a uh, few nice examples, uh, especially um, well prepared for this automat AutoML approach in which you can find new hyperparameters and you can automate, uh, tune them in automated fashion. And the, the last link is exploratable analysis. It's like 300 pages, uh, so it's longer than this tutorial, but in details, it will follow, it will introduce you to the world of model exploration. So if you'd like to learn more about different techniques, uh, how uh, to uh, plot or how to uh, evaluate or how to calculate uh, particular metrics, how you can change them, what are their parameters and how these parameters affect the, the, the behavior, you can go there and you will find much deeper description with snippets of code for both R and Python. So, also, of course, I'm biased because I'm one of co authors, but highly recommend reading. And I think that with this, we are close to the end of the first part. In the next two parts, you will learn more about the um, automation. Sorry, it's here. The automation is like now we spend a lot of uh, time to type all, 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 all these comments to, to, to our. You need to remember names of these parameters, names of these functions, and you need to remember some additional uh, arguments. So all these things can be automated. And in the next uh, part, uh, in the third part, you will learn about the model studio at the model arena uh, for automation. And in the second part, just after the break, you will learn about another set of techniques, very important in responsive machine learning, related to the fairness. So Kuba introduced you to the fairness and um, Hubert introduced you, we introduce you to the, to the automation. We have still like five minutes before the break. So if there are some questions uh, that remain, I am more than happy to, to answer your questions. And all again, um, together with um, my colleagues, you are working on this uh, crazy approach to presentation of uh, machine learning through math, software, and comic book. If after this workshop, uh, if you have time to read these materials, and if you have any ideas what should be changed, included, added, removed, more than happy to, to, to hear. Please contact with, uh, with us. Uh, your, your, your opinion will be very, very important for us. Um, uh, yeah. I saw that there are some questions. Uh, let's, let's keep in touch. For the Polish slides and English slides, so these materials that you have here, they are not final. And we expect to have final materials closer to the fall. So because sometimes there are some dirty tricks, uh, please do not uh, maybe share this dirty version. Uh, you will get the, uh, the, the clean version closer to the fall. So 
and this will be the version that that um, uh, we'll be happy to share. Um, uh, yeah, of course, all our materials are, uh, are uh, you can access them and you can use it for teaching. Uh, for the Emma book, you can get the paper copy, but the um, online copy is for free on the DPL license. These materials currently, they're still in progress, but once they will be public, they will be also an open license, so you are more than a, welcome to, to use it and of course uh, even more more than welcome to share um, experience from from uh, from um, teaching with them uh, with, with us so you can use it and uh, please do so we are more than uh, encouraged to, to do so i saw that uh, there was a lot of questions yeah, but I all of them yeah that's great answer them, uh, answer them now. Yeah. There was a question whatever the, there is a presentation in Polish. Uh, not yet, but the book will have two, versions, two language versions, actually four language versions, Polish, English, and Python R. So, of course, we are more R users, uh, but, but we know that there are other communities there. And so, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I do not see other uh, questions or comments. So, let's have a break. And... Um, uh, it should be like 30 minutes or five. Five? First break? Yeah. Okay. Ten? Okay. <laughs> so let's make a short uh, break, uh, like 10 minutes. So let's meet uh, again after 10 minutes and then we'll go to the um, two other points. Here, uh, sorry that we don't have enough time to execute everything in our console. Actually, you have prepared our studio. But uh, I see that the time is uh, kind of run out, run out. But I know that in the remaining two parts, there will, there will be a plenty, plenty of opportunities to actually execute uh, uh, some R code in the R console. So uh, yeah, let's see again in 10 minutes and, and let's play with, with, uh, with fireness and uh, packages for automation. Mm, OK, so I am Jakub Wiśniewski and I am developer of Fair Models. And today we'll learn about this tool, how to use it, gain some intuition. So let's get to work. So first of all, why is this all important? Well, machine learning models and <laughs> machine learning models and decision systems have been have a history of discrimination and somewhat shady practices. For example, in this machine, uh, in the work of ProPublica, they found that the software used across United States for predicting whether someone would be a recidivist or not was biased against blacks. And it is the case that we'll uh, be focusing on in the practice part today. In gender shades, the um, researchers found that the popular uh, gender classifiers were biased against darker females and the accuracy was um, the gap between accuracy between uh, lighter males and darker females was around 30 percent and google fixed its racist uh, algorithm by removing the labels of gorillas because uh, their model classified black people as gorillas. So as you can see, there are many harms to be made. So we have to watch out. So what is this bias? What do we mean by, by bias? Well, um, bias can have many sources, for example, like historical data or, or some labeling process. And we can define it as a different treatment of some groups of people by the model. Um, and this uh, this collection of subgroups will be called a protected vector. As you can see on the right side, uh, on the right top side, there are two examples of, of these protected vectors. It can be, for example, ethnicity or sex. And one of them will be called privileged, uh, for example, male or, or female. Mm, and it can be described by some non-discrimination criteria like separation, independence, and sufficiency. And they are this Mm, this independence or independence given some uh, other variables, then they measure the, the, 
bias in in mathematical way but this mathematical way isn't like practical uh, for us we would like something um, to not be approximated by uh, but calculated directly so we have to use some metrics and um, with the help of confusion matrix for each group of people uh, for each subgroup uh, we'll be uh, taking this uh, matrix derived from the confusion matrix like TPR, positive predictive value, uh, false positive rate, precision, etc., etc. And these metrics are either relaxations or equivalents of this independence, separation, and sufficiency criteria. So let's get some intuition. Imagine that we have two subgroups, one of them is privileged and one of them is unprivileged and we are predicting the credit rate. So a group A um, has acceptance rate of 80% and group B of, 30, uh, of 50%. You may say, okay, maybe group A has better uh, credit history or, or is wealthier than group B. Well, okay, but it turns out that from a group A, 90% of good credit seekers got the credit Meanwhile, in group B, this percentage was only 60%. Uh, so um, these are these two different ways of, of measuring um, the bias. And in the first case, the used metric was statistical parity ratio. And in the second one, it was true positive ratio. So how to do it easily, of course, with fair models. It uses Dalek package as a backbone, and it is designed to work on group fairness metrics. And so, as you know, any classification model would work. Uh, why classification? Well, this, uh, this flow is designed for the uh, classification models, but uh, from recently, you can also use uh, regression models for it. Mm, and it has this iterative approach. Uh, as you can see, uh, you start with a model, you explain it, and you make a fairness check. You see if it passes per fairness check. If yes, great. And if no, you can use some uh, bias mitigation methods. If you have more than one model, for example, dozen models, a uh, better way would be to visualize uh, some of these bias some of these metrics with other visualization tools, pick the uh, one with uh, smaller parity loss, and uh, either uh, this, this one uh, passes the fairness check or you have the bias with uh, model with least bias. So as you can see, the, this approach, this iterative approach is easy for both prototyping and testing. And let's see how it looks in the code. So uh, in the GitHub repository, you have a file called fairmodels.r and uh, you can uh, go along the code with me. Let's import the needed libraries. Maybe I will make it bigger, okay. And then uh, you have to uh, run this line. It will download the data because the data in fairmodels is a little bit uh, more focused, more, more, uh, a little bit smaller. And this data has a lot of um, different uh, columns, but we will be, as in the Propublica case, we will be predicting if someone will be a recidivist in two year time or not. And we will have the information about uh, amount of priors, what is the decile scores, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I hope that you downloaded this data now. Mm. So we will uh, process it. And we end up with data that looks like this. So we have information about uh, the age, the charge degree, race and sex, um, how many days uh, was this person in jail, and of course if 
if it, uh, he or she is a res recidivist or not. So first of all, uh, in fair models, we would like to predict the favorable outcome. So we have to flip these labels. So we predict not whether someone would, would be a recidivist, but the event uh, where he or she would not be a recidivist. So we are flipping. Mm, and we'll make this simple linear uh, logistic regression model. And as you know, this, uh, uh, this explain function will explain the model, giving the data and the target. We'll check the model performance. It's quite all right. And now we'll make a fairness check. So uh, it goes like this. We have uh, to provide an explainer, this protected vector, which in our case is a vector with race. And we have to provide uh, a privileged parameter, uh, which is in our case Caucasian, which we suspect that will have the most privilege. So um, let's run this code. Uh, and it gives us this Dalek-like interface where we can see the, um, what were the uh, types of the uh, parameters that we passed, uh, how, they, uh, how did they change, um, how many explainers were, were there in total, what are the cutoffs for those explainers, and what are the, uh, how many metrics calculated properly. So let's assign this, uh, this output of the function to a variable. We'll call it f object, and it is of class fairness object. And th this, this, um, this variable can be printed and plotted. So maybe I will make it just a little bit bigger. Um, so we'll go through uh, every, everything that, uh, uh, that is on the plot here. Um, as we can see, there are bars for each of the subgroups, uh, and there are five metrics that, that are calculated, both with this fairness metric name and the way to uh, how to get it using the confusion matrix. There are two fields, green and red, and of course, intuitively, uh, we would like all bars to be within this green area. Mm, there is this score uh, on the x-axis, uh, but we'll get to this uh, later. Uh, first, let's see what this fairness object consists of. So uh, there is a field like group confusion matrices, and it is self-explanatory. Uh, we have a confusion matrix for each model and for each subgroup. Mm, we have also graphs data, which is uh, similarly to, to, to confusion matrices, but it's uh, the matrix for each model and each subgroup. So it's like TPR, statistical parity ratio, uh, false positive ratio, etc., etc. We have also privileged parameter, uh, which we passed. We can see it right here. The protected vector changed to factor. The cutoff also for each model and for each subgroup, because it can be change, uh, changed um, for each of the subgroups individually. And we have an X epsilon value. Uh, we'll also get to this later, but first, uh, we will just make this, uh, this plot uh, a little bit more readable. So we'll be focusing on uh, two of the um, subgroups, Caucasian and African-American. So as you can see, we filtered them out and we'll make this uh, again, the model and the explainer. And just like before the fairness object, and we'll plot it. And yes, it is uh, more visible. So now we'll focus on the x-axis and how to read it. So let me oh, get back to the presentation. 
um, where we have uh, why my slides are okay um, where we have the exact same plot uh, and we have uh, we'll take this uh, value of tpr bar and see how uh, what is the meaning of this bar so it is calculated like this we have a true positive rate for African American, and we divide it by the true positive rate of Caucasian. So it's a ratio of those two metrics. Mm. So intuitively, closer the closer to one, the better. And here, of course, the Caucasian is the uh, protected uh, privileged subgroup, and uh, we divide each uh, of the subgroups by the privileged subgroup score and this epsilon value is a boundary between the green and red fields and it is on default set to 0 0.8 due to equal employment opportunity commission and it is so-called four-fifths rule so basically anything uh, less than 80 percent of the selection rate can be can be judged as as adverse impact uh, but this epsilon value can be of course adjusted to users needs so uh, if you feel like there should be more bias available or, or less then uh, just tweak this variable mm. and here you can see uh, what are the exact boundaries of this green field? Uh, the ratio of the metrics should be within epsilon and one divided by the epsilon. So let's see how does it work. So now we are providing this epsilon variable and we will plot it. And uh, as expected, it shrinks this green field. But let's revert from now for now. And we will, uh, I will just uh, maybe make it a little bit smaller. Mm. We will make more models. So we make a ranger model with uh, 100 trees, certain depth and a seed so you can Mm, have the same uh, uh, the same models as me so we make a model we make a explainer let's see the model performance it is a little bit bigger than the logistic regression and we would like now to compare the th these models so there are a few ways to do it the first one is to get the explainer and the fairness object created earlier and of course uh, we may provide the protected and privileged but uh, we in fact don't have to because uh, there is al uh, already protected and privileged hidden in the uh, f object or fairness object so we may uh, just run it like this we get the information that it was uh, it was taken from the first fairness object or we can uh, have two fairness objects and merge them together for example like this we make a second one and we merge it with first we can of course can uh, have multiple explainers so we get this logistic regression and this random forest and now we have to provide the protected and privileged and all this in all these ways we got the same the same object that can be plotted now so as you can see we can now compare uh, those metrics uh, across the models and the ranger was slightly better at equal opportunity ratio but slightly worse at predictive equality ratio but in fact it passes more than uh, more metrics than uh, this linear model we can um, see this like that object 
yeah, so Ranger passes three metrics and linear model passes two metrics. And this total loss is the summarized height of all of these bars. Mm. So now you may ask, well, uh, what if the race, uh, race column in the data did all of that? Well, uh, we may uh, see how, how, how this affects the predictions. So we make data frame only with few columns. We make a model and explainer. Let's see the model performance. And it is uh, similar to the first random forest. And we can now compare those models for each other. Can we do, the, do it like this? Well, no, because um, fairness check has to uh, has to have uh, explainers with distinct labels. So we will provide the label parameter. And this label parameter can be either uh, one value or a vector of values. Uh, it has to be the same length as the uh, amount of explainers. Here we have one explainer, so uh, label will be just one value. So let's run it and let's pro plot it. So we get a little bit less, but the change isn't that significant. So um, we will uh, later we'll see how we can uh, mitigate that bias. But first, let's uh, learn about different ways ways of visualizing that bias. So, for example, if you want to uh, see the raw scores of the metrics, we have uh, such pipeline that we provide f object to some uh, visualization technique. Mm, in this case, it is metric scores, and then we plot it. So here we have a shape for each subgroup and a color for each model. And the uh, Caucasian subgroup is represented by this vertical, uh, vertical line. So intuitively, the, the bigger the distance of the, the, this point or, or the shape to the vertical line, the worse. So uh, in the case of accuracy, the distances are, mm, are small. So it is a uh, less uh, biased metric than, for example, false positive rate. Mm, but there are other ways to, uh, to, to visualize this bias. And we'll now learn a tool for, that will allow us uh, for more flexibility. So uh, this tool is called parity loss. And for example, let's take this true positive rate metric. And if we would like to calculate the parity loss of this metric, it would be sum of absolute values of the ratio, logar uh, natural logarithm of the ratio. So uh, let's not get into math, let's get into, in, uh, into intuition. Uh, the closer uh, the ratio is to one, the smaller the parity loss will be. And uh, this parity loss aggregates all of the subgroups, all of the metrics for the subgroups into one metric. Okay, now we'll uh, see how to make those visualizations. But first, let's access this um, parity loss uh, in our fairness object. It can be accessed like this. And uh, let's make um, first visualization. It will be fairness radar. So we have five metrics. All of them uh, are, uh, the values are the parity loss. And each of the visualization methods has its own uh, documentation. And the fairness metrics visible in the plot can be changed. So let's change them for visibility to those ones. And we have only um, now three. And it is a little bit easier for us to compare the models. What if we would like to have all the metrics? 
Well, uh, we can do it with the help of Furnace Heatmap. It shows us parity loss uh, for all of the metrics uh, with dendrograms, which show us both the similarity between the metrics and the similarity between the models. And what if you would like to see summarized metrics? We have to stack them first. So we have this stacked metrics plot, and it is this accumulated parity loss uh, for all, all of the metrics. And what if you would like to have a um, see both the performance and the fairness metric at the same time? Uh, we have something called performance and fairness, and it uh, we have to pass this fairness metric and the performance metric to it. So let's do it just like that. And uh, here you have uh, an accuracy on the x-axis and inversed false positive rate parity loss on the y-axis. And note that this is the, an inverse value. And it is done because we would like uh, intuitively uh, our models to be on the top right corner. If, uh, for example, some model would be uh, here, then it would mean that it has the, uh, the least parity loss and the most accuracy. So what if it's uh, all a lot of functions and it is hard to remember? Well, um, fortunately, we have a, uh, a function for that that uh, shows what are the available um, ways of visualizing the, the bias. And we just have to passed the, uh, the name of the, the type to the function plot for models. Now we will we'll do it with stacked metric, metrics and we get the same result, fortunately. Mm. And now, okay, uh, we have this bias and uh, the question is, what can we do about it? Well, there is actually a lot of that we can do. So uh, there are two bias mitigation strategies uh, implemented in fair models. First is data pre-processing and explainer post-processing. And today we'll cover the uh, resampling, reweighting, uh, reject option-based classification uh, pivot and cutoff manipulation. Uh, so the resample focuses on mitigating the statistical parity ratio and it duplicates the underrepresented observations from unprivileged subgroups and it removes the overrepresented observations from privileged subgroups. And it bases actually on reweight uh, that computes weights by uh, dividing the theoretical um, probability of, of uh, giving the favorable label uh, for the subgroup uh, by the observed probability. And the reject option-based classification pivot, uh, it, uh, just like the last word, it pivots the uh, probabilities um, close to the cutoff to the other side of the cutoff. So if you have, uh, uh, for example, in close proximity, of the cutoff uh, that is on default 0 0.5 and we define some theta uh, to be um, 0 0.1 so the area is 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 and if it's the unprivileged subgroup receives a probabilistic response of uh, within uh, the left proximity of the cutoff then it will be uh, switched, it will be pivoted to the other side. And if the opposite uh, thing happens, when the privileged subgroup is on the right side of the cutoff, it will be pivoted to the left side. So let's see how to make it in fair models. We'll make a uh, fairness object with random forest explainer. And first resampling, we have to provide this protected vector and the target of the model. We get the uh, indices from 
from this, this, this resample output, and we can get the data from it. So we'll create this data frame, uh, data frame resampled, and we'll use it for this model creation. And we'll make a explainer out of it with label resampled. We'll make a furnace check, just like before, adding the explainer to the uh, furnace object, and we will plot it to compare. And as you can see, uh, the bias uh, is uh, less significant, but it's still visible. So let's go to reweight, and it is the same um, as, as the resampled. So we get a uh, we get protected vector, we get the target of the model, and in response, we get this weights. And we provide it as case weights to, to our ranger. And we, of course, make explainer, fairness object, we just add it incrementally, and we plot it. So the bias is even less significant, but there is still two metrics that uh, that do not fit into this four fifths rule. So now we will go to the post processing, and we have to provide this um, random forest explainer. It can be. Uh, every explainer it can be reweighted, reweighted, resampled, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we for now provide the base one. We make a fairness check with label arrow C, and we plot it. So our explainer now has, uh, with this flipped probabilities, has a. Mm, even even less bias, and it actually fits in this green area. So, so it is very very nice. And um, now we have a cutoff manipulation method, and we provide the explainer to the fairness check. So we have a brand new fairness object, and we pass it to Ceteris Paribus cutoff with a subgroup African-American, and I will explain to you uh, what it does. Mm, it changes the cutoff only for the African-American uh, subgroup, and that's why it is called Ceteris Paribus cutoff, because other cutoffs are constant. And the lowest value uh, came out to be 0.36. So we now may uh, add this random first explainer, but with different cutoff for the subgroup and different label. So now we have even less bias. Uh, the least bias I think that can be. We may uh, see this in the plot, uh, the print method and yeah the ranger cutoff has the least total loss of of the party mm. now we may for example check the false positive rate and the accuracy of the model and uh, here you can see something called fairness performance trade-off we have the biggest uh, accuracy for the ranger model, slightly less accuracy for the slightly less biased models, and the lowest accuracy um, and the least bias um, for ranger, uh, ranger cutoff that, that, that has uh, the minimal bias here. The difference in accuracy isn't significant. Um, so uh, depending on your needs, you may you may choose the, the most suitable model for your case. So now we have a exercise. I will check uh, how much time do we have. Uh, okay, maybe we will, um, I will just post the, uh, the, 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 five minutes, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, 
but I have a little bit more to go through. I will post the solution on the GitHub um, within, for, uh, for example, like an hour. So that is a exercise for you. You may uh, we make it and check with, uh, with my solution. Um, and now I will introduce you briefly to the regression module. So uh, we have this decile score that is uh, a value um, assigned by this this north point system that was uh, that was analyzed by propublica and for the uh, caucasian we see that the decile scores are lower um, and they are uh, Mm, this way of representing the probability uh, of reoffending, and for the African Americans, these scores are more or less constant. So, uh, just for your knowledge, this is uh, mm, the the, uh, the, the target will be regression, but it will be not like this true grand truth target, but it will be uh, more like. Mm, maybe a little bit biased uh, biased column that we will be trying to, to predict. So uh, let's uh, filter out um, two of the columns that, that we will no longer need. And now we'll have uh, um, the uh, data frame for the regression problem. We'll make a ranger. We'll make an explainer and we will make a fairness check. But you have to note that the uh, function name for the fairness check in regression is fairness check regression. So um, we do it just like this. And as you can see, uh, we have only three metrics that we will, uh, that we will be um, checking. Let's assign it to a variable and let's plot it. And you have this free non-discrimination notions uh, that, that are being approximated uh, by logistic regressions model inside the uh, fair models. And this approach is more or less experimental. So if you use it uh, and have some, uh, some thoughts, uh, please share it with me. I will be uh, really honored. So yeah, uh, this will be our, uh, this sums up our fairness uh, tutorial. Uh, there is a, a landing page called Fair Models Dr. Y AI. Uh, you can check, mm, check it, uh, for example, with this uh, QR code. And they are, mm, there is an article, there are blogs, documents, tutorials, etc., etc. And there is also a mm, Fair Models implementation in Spot in Python as a Dalek uh, module. So that will be all for me. I believe there are like five questions that we could answer in the chat. Okay, great. Um, so maybe now I will stop uh, sharing now. Um, okay. Because the first one was, is there a reason why the predicted parity ratio is lower when mitigation strategies are used compared to the base model? Mm, yes, because the, uh, the base model tries to uh, lower the cost function. And the, uh, so it is the, the most optimal uh, model in the, the sense of the data mm, and the Mm, this this mitigation functions, uh, mitigation methods change this output, change this uh, optimal setting, so the uh, the performance is, is lower. Okay, so the the second simple question is: there a hierarchy to the fairness check measures? Is one more important to than other? Mm, great question. Uh, it uh, I don't believe there is a. Uh, some kind of hierarchy. Uh, the most cited ones are the statistical parity ratio and the uh, equal opportunity ratio or the equalized odds. And because the equalized odds are, this, are the uh, true positive rate and false positive rate, this is like a combined metric. 
Um, so these are the most cited ones, uh, but you have to adjust your, your metrics, your perspective uh, um, for your problem. So it is not like universal for, for everything, uh, but um, th these five metrics should, should be sufficient uh, for the uh, basics, for the start uh, of the of fairness exploration and analysis. Do you have a chart? Uh, yeah, but I... I uh, just about the text later. Uh, uh, can you repeat? Okay, I don't want to repeat because they can steal it. Okay, okay, I found it. Uh, are there any alternate reader party? For text data for responsible ML. Um, so for text data in fairness, I um, I didn't encounter one. But if you have a continuous call, uh -huh. you can apply the statistics because they don't mm -hmm. depend on the internal question. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you heard Przemek. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, if, if it's like the uh, probabilistic output, the grand truth um, for, for this binary label um, and the uh, predict, uh, the protected vector, then you can make a fairness analysis. Um, is for models able to take in uh, more than one, uh, oh, I lost, uh, more than one potentially biased variable. For example, if I have uh, more than one, say, race, religion, gender, do I have to check one by one? Uh, well, uh, not at all. You can like merge these uh, variables together. So you have, uh, for example, race, underscore, religion, underscore, gender. Mm. Uh, just like we have in the, the, the uh, first example uh, where we have uh, multiple uh, protected uh, multiple indicators of, of subgroups mm, so for example it would be like caucasian uh, christian male <laughs> for example Is it possible to use fair models with other mitigation methods such as uh, Bayesian optimization methods? Uh, you can do the optimization uh, directly and just compare two models. Right? Mm -hmm. so you have the two models with weak for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> I don't know if you heard Przewek. I will repeat it. <laughs> uh, Mm, yeah, you can it's just. Uh, okay, yeah, you can un unmute it and, and repeat it. Uh, okay, so in this case, uh, Jakob showed that you can actually compare a few models. So with creation optimization, you can do any mitigation strategy on your own and then just have collection of different models and you can compare these models to check whatever the Bayesian optimization was. Um, more efficient than other mitigation strategies. So some of these uh, mitigation techniques are implemented in some models, but you can always do this on your own with some other technique. Yeah, if you have more questions, then please answer it. I will answer it. Okay, so I guess now it's uh, Hubert's time. So thank you. Yeah, great. Okay, I hope that you can all hear me. So once again, I hope that many of you are still here and listening to us. Here is our GitHub repository where you can find all the resources and materials that you are uh, using, we are using today. So I'll be focusing on showing you two tools to our packages that will help you automate your explanatory analysis. 
So it will be the first, I will focus on the model studio and I will rather show the whole idea and uh, not run some code because it would take too long, but you can, uh, you can follow the code in this RMD file if you want. And then I will run some uh, arena code in this in this file, arena R. I will try to run around in our console and we'll go from there. So actually, uh, I would like to answer one question uh, concerning, um, concerning the analysis, like how to automate it. So uh, Przemek talk, uh, talked about a lot of explanations. You can learn about them in, uh, for example, in the explanatory model analysis book or in the materials that we prepared for this workshop. And Kuba also were uh, showing you a lot of code. So I would like to um, briefly show, show the motivation behind creating the model studio and arena packages. Uh, and I will start by introducing you to a simple concept in the uh, using the Dalek package. So here I just load uh, the libraries that will be uh, needed, but actually Przemek was talking about um, mortality prediction. Kuba was talking about some recidivism. Let's, let's maybe use some um, more happy uh, data set to, uh, to assess our models right now. So I'll be using the happiness data is on Kaggle. Actually, it's, uh, it will be also a out of time uh, validation. So the train data set, this is uh, com com data combined from, from the um, years 2015 and I believe 18, and then the test data is from 2019. All the details about how these data sets are combined are on our repository. So here we see as that for a given country, we have its happiness score uh, and also some attributes that are quite intuitive uh, to assess. And it's a good, I believe it's a good example to show how we can explore our models. So uh, here I, 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 we, um, we want to create a black box model, right? And then explain it. So I use the Rancher package, which is great for training random forests. And uh, as was seen before many times, uh, it always begins with the explain function from the Daleks package, where you pass your data and also the target uh, variable the vector. And usually when I start my model exploration uh, analysis, I would uh, probably uh, want to um, find the most important features as well as uh, see what is the dependence of these features on the model prediction. So I would, <laughs> I'm quite, okay, I, I might uh, say that I'm an advanced Dalek, Dalek user, right? So I can write some code that uh, looks like this, also supporting it with a great patchwork package that lets you combine your plots. And here we have a great visualization of what is happening uh, in our model on a global level. So we have feature importance, which shows us the most important features in our model, as well as the partial dependence profiles, which show us uh, how the model prediction depends on a given variable. So this is, uh, these plots are quite complementary, right? One supports each other, uh, the another. So first we want to find the most important features and then we want to assess what is their dependence. And then usually I would proceed and do um, the instance level explanation, right? So for a given observation here, I choose the first observation from the test set. It's actually a Finland country, which has, uh, which in a, for a given year had the highest uh, happiness score. Uh, I will do the same. Uh, but use instance level explanations. So I'd combine the breakdown profile, which shows um, what is uh, what is explanation of the prediction, but also combine it with uh, the what if analysis. So uh, we have a given country and what if uh, the freedom life choices lowers, will the prediction also lower? Or we have the another uh, variable, let's say social support and what if it lowers, right? Um, so it's a quite simple example. But now there are several problems in the approach that I'm showing right now. So the first one is that we uh, need to uh, know how to write a lot of code uh, because this is, uh, these are only two plots, right? And, um, and it might be that our report, our HTML file with our analysis will be really long. So another problem is that I'm showing only an um, explanation of one observation. What if you need to explain your model for uh, 100 patients or 100 uh, clients in bank? then this report would probably have like uh, 50 pages of such plots, uh, such explanations for each observation. Also, the third point is 
after uh, the long code and also um, a lot of uh, long reports is that we would often want to compare the uh, instance level explanations with the uh, global level, uh, the model level explanations. And now, uh, yeah, okay, if I have a, a huge screen, maybe I could fit all of this in, in one screen, right? But I need to scroll to compare, for example, the breakdown profile and the feature importance uh, plot to, sh to see if this, this instance, this Finland country, somehow varies from the overall behavior. Also, if I want to compare this Ceteris previous profile with the, pre uh, the partial dependence profile, I'll also need to um, have them together on one page somehow next to each other. So this reports, like uh, we wanted to create a low code um, library that could be used by everyone really, uh, that could uh, automate the whole process and also um, that could show you more explanations in a more convenient way. So this is where the Model Studio package comes. Uh, so you just load your um, your load the model studio library and really uh, use the model studio function on the explainer object. I uh, see that I also specify uh, one uh, option here. It's a spoiler for I will talk about it in a minute, but it's also for a convenience uh, in the visualization uh, for accessibility. One would say so. I use the model studio function and what it does it. Um, automatically computes a lot of explanations and creates an interactive dashboard uh, from these explanations. And here, the crucial part is that this interactive dashboard is uh, without a server, meaning that all the explanations are first computed and then you can explore them in a, uh, in a HTML file. So it's quite convenient that uh, we can also insert this dashboard uh, inside uh, the rendered uh, vignette, as I'm doing uh, now. But usually in our console, you would just uh, get an HTML file with, with, which you can open with, a, let's say, browser. So we are after running this function, we are presented with such dashboard, which has different panels. I would like to talk about them briefly. So there are um, multiple plots that you can choose to explore. Uh, in this model studio. Uh, let's uh, go through the example that I was showing before. So maybe I will choose the feature importance plot, also partial dependence plot. Here we can try to do the breakdown analysis and the Ceteris Paribus plot. Okay, that was uh, quite easy. I didn't need to code like 20 lines of code. I just, uh, I just, I'm just exploring the model, right? Less time coding, more time exploring. So actually, the default uh, would be that the model studio dashboard uh, has uh, chooses uh, some free observations that uh, it will uh, that it will let you explore, and we can uh, analyze uh, the breakdown plot next to our feature importance plot, and the feature importance plot next to our partial dependence. Maybe I would like to change the variable uh, to um, to analyze some other uh, some other relationship. Okay, it's nothing interesting here. Oh, this plot looks more interesting. Right now I'm um, now I'm analyzing the health life expectancy dependence on the average prediction of a model. Here is the PDP plot, but also we have the what if analysis for a given instance. So we see that the P PDP plot is quite consistent with the what if analysis for this plot, which is great. Mm. Of course, at any given time, we can also uh, go and uh, look for another variable, another observation that we can analyze. So there are three caveats that I would like to highlight about this dashboard before we proceed to talk about uh, more parameters of this uh, of this um, of this uh, function. So the first is uh, that uh, there are also some um, some uh, EDA plots, meaning exploratory data analysis, which I guess that is quite important in machine learning also to uh, analyze your data. So maybe I'll show the feature distribution plot. Um, so usually we don't think about it, um, it's not presented in a way, but actually uh, we now know that it's really important to analyze our explanations next to the data. Um, for example, if we have the partial dependence plot, we can see if the feature distribution uh, somehow varies between, uh, between those two. We can also choose another plot, it was like target versus feature, okay. So here we see the, um, the data, um, the data analysis plot, for what is the relationship between the target feature and the and the variable, and we can somehow see that um, the model and uh, the random forest model uh, somehow imitate, uh, imitates this 
uh, relationship right with its uh, dependence. Mm, right here, uh, this is a small uh, small footnote where you can see some measures that were calculated for this model for the given data set, which is in the ex uh, explain uh, explainer. Uh, so this is a regression model, therefore we show the regression measures. Mm. And also uh, the second um, thing in the footnote is this uh, stamp, I would say. Right, so we see which version of the package, um, uh, we see for which version of the package this dashboard comes from, but also the date and time, it's often useful to know where your analysis was, uh, was conducted. And of course, some of these features can be uh, customized. Uh, finally, the third uh, point that I would like to um, discuss briefly uh, is that uh, I would say that this is a feature in an experimental stage, but it's quite useful for people that at first glance might not know um, the meaning of the explanations. So this is the, uh, the descriptions here that you can hover over and uh, get some textual description of your explanation. Well, this might be pretty simple, right? The, and also some, uh, some decision was made to choose that the number of important variables for range of prediction is two out of six. And also these are uh, the variables of the highest importance. Uh, they are here. Um, so maybe for PDP, we can uh, see, okay, another textual description. It doesn't always work perfectly. Uh, so it explains uh, the plot, right? So it says what is the mean prediction. Uh, on the given validation data, uh, what uh, where is the highest uh, prediction, uh, where does it occur, mm, and also if there are some uh, breakpoints, right? Uh, so sometimes in the explanation there might be some breakpoints that this uh, description might um, suggest. Overall, it's uh, I would say experimental feature, so um, it won't be maybe it won't be like greatly accurate but it might be useful for people who are seeing these plots first time and don't even know what they mean. Mm. Okay, so this was a default model studio. This is what we will see if you copy and paste any example from the documentation. And now I would like to mention some parameters of this uh, dashboard, of the, of the dashboard function. And I, I would like to say that, of course, the, these parameters are uh, well described in the documentation as well as in the package vignettes, uh, but um, uh, let's get started. So um, we didn't pass any observations before. Uh, there is, of course, a possibility to choose the, the observations that, we would, uh, that you would like to use for local explanations. Um, so here, if I choose these uh, explanations, I pass them as a new observation parameter. Also, I can uh, specify their score. So um, here in this drop-down box, uh, apart from the observation name, which is actually a row name for the data frame, you will get uh, the target, right? So we can compare predictions to the original value. Okay, but also if you don't want to explore any particular observations, you can just increase the number of observations that, uh, sh that the local explanations will be calculated for, for example, to 10. I'm not running these dashboards as they won't uh, vary much. Uh, okay, but uh, some people might want uh, uh, to focus on uh, someone only with a few plots and uh, or they have a smaller um, devices to watch this as for so on. Therefore, there is a parameter, one of the most important, which is a face setting parameter where you can set how many there will be face setting in this dashboard. So here I would say uh, we have a small model studio with only two panels, uh, where for, which is, for example, convenient if you want to analyze instance level explanations. So what you would usually do is uh, have a breakdown which uh, shows the attributions into observation prediction but also you are interested in what if, right? Uh, so clicking on those bars will make the what if analysis change and you can clearly see what will happen if uh, any variable increases. So for example, for this country, if the generosity variable increases, the prediction won't change much. Um, right, so this is also variable not really used uh, for this instance. And here we have uh, the social support variable, which actually will lower the prediction if it lowers. So 
this is a smaller version of Gmodel Studio, uh, but actually uh, you can um, you can increase right the dimensions if you have a huge monitor and you want to analyze all six explanations next to each other or really dive deep into your exploration. You can increase uh, the dimensions of the dashboard. I might I, I'm aware that you might not uh, clearly see all the text here, but uh, I'm just presenting the general idea of. Um, of these uh, of these panels so if you are um, i would say more advanced user and you would like to really dive deep into the exploration process uh, then you can create a larger dashboard and analyze more plots in it and i would say it might be quite convenient okay mm, right so here's a larger model studio now Coming uh, to the parameters, of course, this function has a lot more parameters that you can customize. So the one of the most important parameters also are the N and B parameters, which stand for N samples and B bootstrap uh, runs, I guess. Uh, so as we know, the explanations are estimated from the data, but uh, they, mm, they might have uh, long computation times, therefore, if you have like um, 100,000 observations in your data, you would sample only 1,000 of them to create some of these explanations. Uh, so the end parameter um, says, tells you uh, how many observations will be used for the partial dependence and accumulated dependence profiles. Now you can increase this number, which of course will prolong the computation time of the function or you can decrease it. Mm, also, there is a corresponding parameter for the feature importance method. So here, um, 3,000 observation or less, if you have less in your data set, will be used to calculate this importance. Now, the B value is for uh, for the bootstrap rounds of the feature importance method. So maybe I have a plot here, which I can show you. Okay. So this uh, box plus correspond to the different rounds where we estimate the feature importances, right? So if you want stable, more stable results, you would increase the B value, but it will take more time to compute. Um, and the same goes if, for the Shapley values, uh, they might be quite as unstable. So increasing the, uh, the B parameter might help. And then, um, and then, of course, the dashboard will take longer to compute, but you will get uh, better explanations. Okay, so there are these uh, these four parameters that you should uh, you should probably have in mind, and if in doubt, uh, check in documentation uh, how they affect the creation of the dashboard. Now, I know a lot of uh, power users of Google Studio who like to customize everything. And the good, good um, uh, information is that there are a lot of parameters there that you can really customize. So just going um, going through the few of them. Um, so the max uh, variables parameter will tell you how many um, how many variables will be present in the feature importance plots and um, breakdown or Shapley values plots. And so usually we are only interested in like three to five most important variables, and then it's useful to lower this number, I believe the default value is 10. Some of you may not like the animations of the visualizations, then you can set the time to zero and they will disappear, hopefully. Mm, and so here I lower the time of, uh, I, I make the animation faster. And here is a really crucial parameter and that we should have in mind, meaning that of course, uh, we are uh, we are want to be responsible machine learning uh, engineers, right? So we want to compare our explanations with data exploration visualizations. But uh, there is there are some use cases where you don't want to do that, and precisely this is a situation where you want to share the explanations of your model with others, but don't want to share the data. Right, so maybe you are in company and want to share the explanations of your model, but don't want to share the data of your clients, or maybe you are working with some medical data and these are classified. Note that uh, this dashboard is a standalone HTML file that you can really send to someone through email, 
And if it um, if it produces these uh, exploratory data analysis visualizations, then the whole data set or a subset of it will be present in this HTML file, right? So you will be sharing these visualizations, but you will also be sharing the data in the HTML file. If someone wants, they will be able to uh, extract them. So if you are working with some classified data and you are sharing uh, your model analysis to, with someone, then uh, it's, it's probably wise to set the EDA parameter to false. Mm, further, um, more parameters uh, that are for customizing the appearance of the dashboard are available in the options variable. Using the MS option function, you can override the defaults which are present in documentation. So here I'm using the parameter that I was talking about before. It's the margin left parameter, which uh, is probably one of the most uh, popular options to change when you have really long variable values. Uh, you will increase this uh, value. Of course, you can change uh, the default most generic title of the dashboard. And if you want to uh, be more accessible to others, I guess you can think about changing the line size and some point sizes, increasing them, right? Um, and if you like other colors, you will change and the colors of uh, explanations. Okay, so here I have the dashboard generated with these options. I hope it fits into my screen. So we see already that the colors changed. The animations are more faster. Uh, they are faster. I don't know if you can see that. Also, there are no EDA plots here, which I also mentioned. And in the feature importance plot, you will have uh, only four maximum variables. Um, okay. So I guess there are more uh, more observ more functions that you can use. Uh, to update your model studio. Um, if you forget to set any of these parameters, you can add more observations to your uh, analysis, right? And also, maybe you want to save these dashboards as RDA files, right? Or objects, not so HTML files, then you can load them later and change, for example, the appearance of the dashboard. Um, so I would say this is quite convenient to search for these two functions in the documentation. Okay, I believe that this is quite an introduction to the Model Studio dashboard. Um, and I would like to highlight also the another package, uh, which is the Arena dashboard, which is quite uh, advanced tool. And the most important thing is that it will compare multiple models. So uh, here I have the code that is from GitHub. It's quite short. It has like 100 lines of code, and I will go through it uh, really fast. So I load uh, the libraries and data, and uh, I want to brute force this uh, predictive problem. So I just fit all the um, fit all the, all the models and uh, and create all the explainers from them, right? So I was mentioning before that we can create all these explanations, uh, which will um, which will take six models and and create uh, visualizations for them, but it it's maybe not quite convenient. Here we see that this plot is quite clunky. Uh, so what we would like to do is to create an, an application, the RN application, push a lot of explanations into it, meaning add them into the dashboard, and also add observations into the dashboard. It's a sim quite similar to the Moodle Studio, but here you add uh, more models. And finally, we run the arena. So he here we see that, okay, I should have this open. Okay, here I have the, this example running now. And this is an advanced dashboard and arena dashboard that you can explore multiple models. It has a great documentation resources, uh, which, uh, which, are, uh, which are under uh, the arena Dr. Y AI uh, domain, but I would like to briefly sh show how to use it. So you can choose multiple models to explain. And the first thing that uh, most of us would do is actually uh, comparing the performance of the models. Uh, so um, here are the metrics. Okay, they just calculated. I can, um, I can now. I'm free to like experiment with these visualizations, make them larger, smaller, and such. And there are more customization um, possibilities. So in this plot, for example, I see that the best model are SVMs, and I also would like to compare it, I guess, to the Ranger model. So I can already um, give models that are maybe not suited for me due to their performance. I can leave this uh, for future users later. 
Um, and now I would like to do the exact the same analysis that I was doing with the model studio, but I will be uh, doing it for multiple models. So the first plot is the variable importance, uh, which will compare the importance of these uh, of these uh, variables for multiple models. Mm, if some plot is too small, like we can always make it full screen and, uh, and uh, analyze it more um, deeply. Um, okay, so I see uh, where these um, these models vary, right, in their uh, uses of their predictors, uh, but um, but it's quite uh, similar overall. So uh, the best uh, feature of this dashboard, uh, apart from it that we can analyze multiple models, is actually that we have a lot of more pages. And so here I click the plus sign and I create another page and the analysis is not lost. So I will create another page. I would also change the name of the project to maybe uh, user 21 as we are here now. And for these three models, I would like to compare their partial dependence. Uh, which is quite convenient uh, for a given variable. So this interface is quite similar. Here we have the change in observation, the change in the variable. So we can choose another variable, let's say health life expectancy. Okay, it's computed in the background and we have another plot. We can lock this plot on a given variable, right? So we couldn't do that in Model Studio. We can lock it and for a given variable, now change the variable back to G per capita and here we have another uh, plot. Of course, uh, they can't fit here because I enlarged the, the whole dashboard so you can see it uh, better. Uh, but uh, when I uh, when I decrease the zooming, it, it should fit better. So this would be the model analysis of different uh, variables. Uh, of course, you can com compare it to the variable importance. Um, showing off only the uh, model explainers, but I can also uh, compare different explanations for um, for local level understanding, right? So here we have the Finland observation. Okay, maybe I'd like to also uh, compare it to the Shapley values of the Poland country. It takes some time to compute, but after a while we have these plots. Um, so th this is what I'm showing now is a live uh, dashboard that computes, right? Uh, all the explanations, but actually you can also save the whole data uh, and then uh, analyze it later. Uh, so here, there's another part of the code that I won't be running now because it will take some time to compute and it will uh, save in the JSON all the data, right? So I would run this, uh, this code. It's, uh, it's quite uh, similar, uh, but I will, instead I will save the data. And then uh, here are our sources that you can um, either upload this data to some server and then just add here the URL so that the dashboard will download this data or you can add this file as it is and explore all the possibilities. And there are a lot of uh, the a lot of the parameters in this Arena dashboard also, uh, so I won't uh, have any time maybe to go through them. But I really recommend you to go to the documentations. All of these uh, all of these concepts, all of these um, caveats are really uh, explained here. And maybe even if we have videos where you can see how some uh, how we can annotate some plots using marker, and there are also all the options explained here. So I think this is a great resource, and if, if you think that this, uh, this dashboard will help you in your, in your work, then mm, consider uh, using this documentation as your next resource. Yeah, I'll say that this will wrap up uh, this, uh, this automation uh, part.